Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Samurai Wallet, a Bitcoin wallet that recently announced they are incorporating BTC XMR atomic swaps. The two discuss how this passion project came to fruition, the drama and blowback of BTC maxis since the announcement of Monero atomic swaps, if it's sustainable to continue the battle and be ahead of chain analysis companies, how they see Monero and Bitcoin coexisting in the future, and the reasoning behind using this wallet to shield Bitcoin versus just using Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Samurai Wallet. What, what do I refer to you as, sir? Uh, hey, it's a good question. You can you can either call me a uh, samurai wallet guy, WGSW. I have various various uh, pseudonyms that I go by. Okay. Whatever you want to whatever you want to use. So how how long have you been? Um, I wouldn't say in the public eye, but like out there talking talking on pod- podcasts and is it, is that something that's recently been happening or you've been out um, there for a while? No, I've been doing it for a while. Um, even before before we started Samurai Wallet, I kind of was I was involved in the the Bitcoin space from around mid to late 2012, I would say. Um, and really early on, I got like I caught the bug, and and it was it was I knew it was something that I wanted to like really get into in, in a way that was much deeper than just like buying some Bitcoin and holding, you know, and doing all that kind of thing. I, I wanted to earn it, you know? So I found a way of, of transitioning my already successful fiat career into, into Bitcoin. Um, and part of, part of that career involves, you know, uh, podcasts and, and conference circuits and all that kind of thing. Uh, so I was doing that kind of early on, but, but, Primarily, the most uh, most of it has been now since we started Samurai in 2015. Uh, that's what I uh, primarily am focused on, you know, full time. What was the fiat career, if you don't mind me asking, or you don't want to? I don't, I don't uh, know. I'm not sure how much info you're you're willing to give up or what you normally talk about. So no, no, it's fine. I have no worries I mean, if you don't want to comment on anything. Definitely. I mean, if there's nothing, if if, if I don't want to say something, I'll let you know. Uh, I was. Focused uh, in the financial services sector, um, mostly around um, UI and UX of, of you know, uh, bank apps types of situations. You know, nothing too exciting, uh, but I spent a lot of time building out um, front end experiences, UI, UX, and um, product development for for traditional financial services. Oh, awesome! Okay. Um, so when you set out to build Samurai, how'd you how'd you put the team together? How'd you find the guys with the chops to do the back end stuff? Oh man, it was it was really organic. It was it was really for a long time for for uh, I would say three years. It was just me and my partner T Dev D. Uh, it was the two of us. We we were working at a we were working full time in the industry, and um, you know we we had felt both independently that there was just a um, an empty spot in the space where there had once been focus on privacy and fungibility and uh, permissionless technology, things really kind of started to shift around 2015 to more institutional, more um, giving up certain like kind of core core tenants like uh, non-custodialism and stuff like that if it would bring about, you know, institutions. And we, we had a problem with that. And, and Samurai was very much like a response to that. Uh, and it was just that both of us had that kind of independent thing 
uh, thought and feeling. Uh, and it was really just a passion project for many years, uh, nights and weekends kind of deal. Um, until we realized uh, early 2017 that there was definitely something here. People were really flocking to it, our, our little project, which we expected to have a couple hundred, you know, users at most was like now numbering in the thousands. And uh, we were definitely unable to keep up with all the development that needed to happen um, with just the two of us working nights and weekends. So we, we went and made the decision to go full time on it. Awesome. How do you, so it's been bootstrap, you guys have been bootstrapping it this entire time? Is it funded in any way or how you yeah, guys? It, it has been funded from private individual investors, you know, friends and family type of deals. Um, entirely, it, everything is entirely BTC with us. Uh, we don't have fiat bank accounts or anything like that. Um, all deals are BTC. So, so it, you know, it really took individuals with balls of steel to kind of, part with their their Bitcoin for such an unorthodox and and frankly risky proposition for them. Um, but, you know, they, they did. There was quite a few, uh, you know, early, very early core guys who allowed us to go full time on this. Um, yeah. And what was the proposition? Like, what what are they? Why are they giving, you know, investing in you guys? What's what's the potential return for them? Or is it just I, they, you know, they want I, to help build this think, utility? Yeah, I think for a lot of them, it's about building out the utility. They, they understand and they agree ideologically that privacy is a fundamental, um, well, needs to be a fundamental aspect of, of any monetary system or financial system. Um, and they have an interest as Bitcoin users to see privacy on Bitcoin advance. Um, you know, again, these are early guys from a different generation of Bitcoin users than we see today. Um, and that kind of ethos and that kind of thinking in Bitcoin was very common, you know. So they, I think a lot of it is, is that. And, uh, you know, some of it, they, they see that uh, there is a, there is a um, business opportunity uh, to be had on the Bitcoin blockchain, which doesn't have um, privacy built in at the blockchain layer. Uh, so that gives opportunity to app layer to innovate. And if, you know, at this point, truly, Samurai really is the only kind of um, innovator on the on the app layer in, in Bitcoin privacy. You know, there's various projects here and there, but they're they're at best science projects. You know, they're not there's no they're not going to get real utility or real use. Um, and Samurai is pushing that needle, so I think that they saw the potential there. Um, and and because of our proposition being so uh, unusual. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of investors. It's a, it's a, it's a small number. You can put them all in one hand uh, or maybe two hands these days. Um, but they're the right types of the right types of people. Uh, but we've had to come up with a way that makes the wallet sustain itself. You know, we can't rely on on um, just bringing in investment, which a lot of wallets are able like the big guys are able to do. And we can't rely on on hooking up to um, third party services that are like uh, like exchange services or swap services that are custodial, because mm -hmm. and that's that's you know that's the normal um, business model. Business model, right? Uh, but we have a problem with that. You know, we we're, we're truly very much against custodial services, whether it's for thirty seconds or you know or not. Um, so, so we how, we we don't do that. Yeah. So well, how do you guys do it? Uh, well, we were very early on. We, we, like I said, we had the idea or the the notion that you, Bitcoin users do demand privacy. It is something that they want from the from the chain. Um, and if it's not going to be provided at the protocol level, then it has to be provided at the app level. And in some in some cases, there are certain transactions that users will pay additional uh, uh, additional cost for to get a get a layer of privacy that they wouldn't get by default oh okay uh, so yeah i haven't you i haven't used it only because i, I am a monero guy so i i, I use monero if i was uh, still sure, using sure. bitcoin uh, i would certainly be using samurai from what i understand of it <laughs> i used to use bread wallet back in the day that was my, okay, my bitcoin yeah. wallet that was kind of one of the purer ones back then uh when it yeah. first when it first came out i don't know what direction they've since gone in uh, I think they've added other coins and done a bunch of other I think things. So. Yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, no, they were they were um, pretty solid because they just stuck to spec back then. 
But how, so explain that a little bit more. So what are these kind of services that people would pay sure. for? You're talking about the coin joining and things like that? So yeah, definitely coin join is one of them. Now, uh, the first one we came out with was um, to kind of test the waters to see if people would actually even pay extra for these type of privacy transactions. Uh, and it was based off of an idea that uh, Adam Back and uh, Blue Matt gave, I, I, I don't remember what this, the conference was, uh, but they were talking about the concepts of um, hops of history and how chain analysis companies and services use this this notion of proximity uh, to to you know quote unquote bad transactions or bad uh, sanctioned addresses, and that by the idea basically involved adding additional hops of history before you know, the ad, the, the coins would arrive at the destination address. And it was, it's a, just a very naive way of battling this very naive, uh, heuristic that uh, chain analysis has come up with in terms of this, this, uh, proximity. Um, so the feature we came out with back in, uh, like I said, 2016, I believe was called ricochet. Uh, and it does exactly that. It adds additional hops of history before your coins arrive at the destination, which is like presumably an exchange or, or something like that. Um, so you're, let's say you're gambling right now, uh, which is against terms of service of Coinbase, for, for example. Um, and you want to uh, deposit into Coinbase, but you're afraid that they might close your account down because you did that gambling and now your coins are like, even, even if they're not mixed with that, those gambling coins, they're close enough for Coinbase to be bothered by it. Um, you would use Ricochet, which would add five additional hops of history. So Coinbase would have to look back, let's say, eight hops. Uh, and if they're looking back eight hops for every user, like you know, they're going to be getting so many false positives. It doesn't really even matter at that point. You know, So it's a really simple uh, transaction, but it's been incredibly effective. Um, I was talking to my Telegram group last night, and uh, I mentioned that in all the years we've been offering, uh, offering Ricochet, we've never had one complaint. Uh, of someone saying that that it didn't work properly, that their exchange account got closed or whatever, or one person saying and they felt it was a ripoff. So we, we consider it a uh, successful service. Uh, so that was the primary one. And then, of course, the main one, the main driver of revenue is CoinJoin, uh, which we just launched uh, early in 2020 uh, or late. Yeah, early 2020 on mobile, we launched um, a Whirlpool CoinJoin. Um, which starts at you know 5,000 satoshis and, and kind of goes up from there. It's one of the most fair pricing models in world in coin join on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know it's very very inexpensive we, because we do a flat fee model. Uh, but it is so far you know we're not you know we're not rolling in it, but it's keeping the lights on, it's keeping the servers running, and it's making sure everything is is kind of moving as it should. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, it's obviously a constant battle, right? Uh, um, it's kind of you, you guys versus the, the chain analytics companies. Definitely. Uh, so would you say you guys, you guys are currently ahead? Um, uh, you mean Samurai? It's specifically our Bitcoin users. Uh, Samurai. Samurai, I think, I think we are keeping ahead of the game. Uh, we've, we've taken strategic steps to, to make sure that we understand the way chain analysis is working, whether that is we have people on the inside who are breaking their NDAs and sending, sending screenshots of the, uh, the software, which we do have a lot of people that do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But also we acquired in 2017 um, a, a company called OXT or Open Exploration Tool, which uh, was started by one guy, one data scientist in France called Laurent, Laurent MT. Um, and it's, he, he, he single-handedly built a phenomenal um, uh, an analysis engine and made it free and uh, available to all users, to all Bitcoin users. So you can actually go in there uh, and, and view your transactions or any transactions, view the cluster information for it. Uh, have access to the same caliber and type of tool that uh, chain analysis has. Um, and we, we acquired uh, him mostly because we were impressed because he actually turned down an acquisition offer from chain analysis. 
um, they wanted to buy OXT. They wanted to buy this software because it is so excellent, and they wanted to acquire his expertise. Uh, and he downright refused them because it would just be totally unethical to him. Uh, and he joined Samurai. Uh, so we have that as a weapon. Uh, so all of our our transactions, all of our uh, coin join, whatever it, whatever it is, whether it exists currently or it's something we're thinking about, goes through a, a, a very intense scrutiny process where we try to break it, where we try to apply the heuristics that um, chain, uh, chain analysis are known to be using today um, and actively undermining those specific heuristics. What, what's to stop, you know, these, these companies from trying to buy you out? I mean, they, they get, they got a lot of, a lot of bucks behind them, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, at that point, it's like the only thing that would stop, uh, <laughs> that is the, the will of the founders. Right. So it, you know, they tried to buy Laurent out and he said no. And I'm pretty confident that both my co-founder and myself would, would say no. And uh, yes, we have we have individual investors, but none of them have the ability to uh, to uh, you know trigger a, a sale of the company like that. So, so I, no, no, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> so I'm obviously always thinking of you know what you're doing versus you know like the Monero option. I mean, how how do you measure that, right? So basically, your approach is you're you're trying to to you know, constantly fight this battle and shore up, you know, the, the castle walls that, you know, the chain analytics companies are, are constantly breaching because of what I see as a kind of a fundamental flaw in Bitcoin, or maybe whether you think it's a flaw or not, but the, the, the nature of Bitcoin, the fact that it's transparent uh, by nature, um, and you guys are working on, you know, software that's essentially not running on top of it, but, you know, running alongside of it, that's trying to make up for that, for that transparency mm -hmm. versus something like Monero that has it built into the protocol. Yeah. How do you, how do you see those differences? Do you, do you think what you're trying to achieve is sustainable long-term? Like, will, will you always stay ahead of the chain analytics companies or do they, uh, essentially have an advantage because of the nature of, of Bitcoin and the fact that it's ultimately transparent? Uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a good question. I mean, first I'll say that I don't, I don't necessarily consider it a flaw because it was designed in that way. Uh, you know, it was understood to be public uh, right from the get-go and, and all of the ramifications of that. Um, however, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself early, like I said, 2012, but certainly my cohorts in that year, we all had the expectation that that privacy was something that needed to be addressed on Bitcoin at the protocol level. And it's something that would be addressed uh, at, uh, at the protocol level. Um, as it's turned out, it didn't work out that way. And, um, you know, at this point, I don't expect there to be any privacy enhancements uh, at the protocol level on Bitcoin. Uh, you know, you'll have a lot of um, ill-informed Bitcoin maximalists tell you that, oh, well, we just activated Taproot and that's a major privacy increase. But no, the actual privacy increasing part of Taproot was the sig uh, sig signature aggregation. Uh, and that part was taken out prior to the activation sequence starting. So now, you know, if we if we want to add that part, which increases uh, the privacy of on-chain coin joints, for example, and, and reduces the cost, um, we need to go through an entirely new activation process through development and through miners and through users of that whole situation. And, um, you know, I don't know if you kept up with all, but it was pretty difficult getting Taproot activated. And that was something that everyone for the most part agreed on no one really had any disagreement about taproot the tech not the tech itself uh whereas anything privacy related i think there's going to be a huge amount of friction right um you're going to have the compliance bro types who view privacy as a threat to number go up view privacy as a threat to the institutional investors etc even though it's the exact opposite but that's what how they feel um, 
So, you know, and that's just how it is. That's the situation we find ourselves in on Bitcoin. It's something that I think we all kind of saw in the long, long term. But we had hoped that, again, that privacy at the, at the protocol layer, and not, maybe not solved, but at least would have been uh, further along, right? Uh, okay, so it's not, that's, not the, that's not the way it's turned out. Um, do I think that there's, uh, you know, a future? Absolutely, yeah. You know, as long as there's a future in Bitcoin, as long as people are using Bitcoin, whether they're using it and it's a surveillance hellscape or not, you know, it, well, it, in fact, it makes the samurai proposition more attractive if it is a surveillance hellscape, right? Because there's always going to be people who want to out, get out of that surveillance hellscape and they're going to look for the tools to do it. Uh, and we're going to be there. It's going to remain niche, I believe, privacy on, on um, Bitcoin. And uh, I think that it's going to be kind of just an overall trend with, with, um, society in general and, and the way things are going in, in the real world, um, there's just going to be pockets of freedom and they're going to be small, perhaps underground pockets of freedom. And, and those pockets are going to need the tools. And Monero is one of those tools. And I believe Bitcoin can be one of those tools if used properly. Um, and that's just about it. And, you know, I'm not looking to go mass market or with anything. You know, it, I just want to have a stack of tools that are available for the people who find themselves uh, who need it. Awesome. So where do you see, you know, Bitcoin, um, or how do you see Bitcoin and Monero, uh, living, uh, in the future? I mean, are they living side by side? Are they, uh, you know, I mean, oh. Bitcoin maxis will, will tell you that, you know, um, it's, they're, it's going to eat the entire, entire world and no other coins will exist. No other projects will exist. Yeah. Uh, I, I assume you don't really see it that way. How do you see it? No, I mean, well, anyone who's been around long enough knows that, that all coins never die. You know, there's always there's always someone who wants to buy and sell that crap, you know, and even though the, 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 the most ridiculous things, there's someone there to buy it. So, no, you know, there's not just going to be Bitcoin and that's it. Uh, I do think that Monero and Bitcoin are going to going to be side by side. I think that uh, Monero has made serious inroads in, in areas that, uh, that Bitcoin used to be dominant. Uh, whether Monero wants to make inroads in those areas or not is another matter, but that's just the reality of the situation. You know, darknet markets have taken on Monero much uh, very readily. Um, and when they, once they do, they pretty quickly discourage Bitcoin altogether. Um, and ransomware have also taken up Monero. Um, these two factors, whether you know you you believe it to be um, you know uh, not attractive, says uh, speaks for the technology and speaks for speaks for the coin, and I think is ultimately a, a bullish indicator for Monero in the grand scheme of things. You know, um, not not uh, advocating for the the crime itself, but but saying that. The technology seems sound. The technology seems solid. Uh, if that remains true, I think that um, well, if, if if that remains true, and the fundamental proposition of Monero remains true, in that it is a a uh, let's say surveillance resistant blockchain, then I think that you you guys can expect a lot of resistance, um, and you can expect at the very least uh, exchange delistings. And, and I, my personal view on the matter is that not only should you, uh, the community expect those things, they should be embraced. Because uh, ultimately that's, a great, that's great news. Uh, and if that does indeed happen, then who do you think your on-ramp is? It's Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the tools that we're building at Samurai are gonna be extremely complementary to a uh, a Monero onboarding via Bitcoin, a uh, scenario that that you know I feel is going to happen in the future, especially if we see uh, Monero get delisted from from cracking, for example, or um, or whatnot. So I think that they are going to exist together, and I think they're going to exist well together. And I mean, within Samurai Wallet itself, users are going to have the ability to perform atomic swaps uh, into Monero. Uh, if they so choose to do so. Uh, so there is going to be a, 
a relationship there. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah, no, it was very exciting. It's very exciting to hear that you guys are moving in that direction. Uh, and obviously that, you know, it was a little bit of a risky thing for you to do, given that you're, you know, first and foremost, uh, a Bitcoin wallet and you're, you're there for the Bitcoin community. So I, you know, I imagine it was a tough decision, right? To And obviously the, the results, I guess, were what you expected. I think there was some pushback, right, from some in the community. So h- how did you uh, go about making that decision? Why did you decide to add Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps, given the fact that, you know, you knew there was going to be blowback by some of the, the maximalists? Uh, well, it wasn't a tough decision at all. It was a, it was to us. It was a no brainer, uh, actually. Um, you know, when when we first read about the uh, atomic swap funding uh, on Monero, we were excited about that. Uh, proposals on Monero, we were excited about that and had uh, both T-Dev and myself and said, let's just keep an eye on this and see how things progress. Um, one of the first features that we had written, noted down in 2015 was this kind of around Robin feature in Samurai that you, you just go from Bitcoin to Monero and back to Bitcoin after some amount of time. Um, because we were naive and thought that Monero was just a copy paste of Bitcoin, that would be an easy thing to implement. But we realized that it's, that's not the case. It's its own beast, and we didn't have the the you know uh, manpower to to do that properly. So we put it on the on the shelf. But so we've been thinking about a feature like this for a long time. Um, as for the response from you know a subset of the community, very small but maybe loud on Twitter, a uh, uh, subset of the community. It's never it's never bothered us before. We've done plenty of things in the past that have been met uh, with the disapproval of that contingent. You know, we we never championed Lightning Network. We're not big fans of Lightning Network. That was our first mortal sin. Um, we're very much against Liquid um, because it's I mean solely because it's a custodial solution and it's being touted as a you know this this fantastic you know bitcoin first solution and this and well it's yeah you can do all sorts of things if you're custodial you know at the end of the day um so we've done all you know we we haven't towed that line for a very long time uh so you know falling out with with that group of people is not something that we we concern ourselves with at all at this point um you know, uh, the other thing about that is we announced we were doing um, this atomic swap. Uh, we were working on this atomic swap stuff in March uh, um, and had been very open about it on 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 Twitter and in our telegrams and, and you know, all everywhere. It's not like we were keeping it a secret or hiding it. People have been asking us about it for a while now. Um, it was only, I guess, last week is when um one of the you know the chief maxi idiots in charge on twitter came out and said you know uh, accused us of being compromised by by a government agency because we had we because we had made the sin of working on atomic swap technology to to uh, monero um i don't think that's what it was about i think that in that particular case our big sin, our moral sin, was the fact that we were going to an altcoin. We were going to Monero instead of using something like Liquid, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is the blessed, the you know, the blessed solution that you must use as the layer two or whatever, something like that. Uh, that's what I think that that little hissy fit was about. Um, yeah, I don't know if you saw and then Giacomo Zucco. He was the one I believe that that tweeted that. That's right. right. And, yeah, yeah. And then he recently did a, a video uh, with Tone Vase, and they they did a whole you know. Two oh, hour man. long, two hour long session on how Monero is a shit coin, and uh, they actually well, I don't you, even think they talked about Samurai, but I think that's what triggered them to go that ahead definitely and start triggered tra- it. trashing Monero. That triggered it. I mean, they, I, I think they came off unhinged. Honestly, like they were just like completely rel- one relying on like talking points from like 2016. And to, like papers like they're from 2017 that have already been either rectified or disproven or or whatever. They, they, that's what they're they're focusing on when they were able to focus on anything coherent. Um, I don't know. They, uh, to to be in the head of a of a maxi like that. I mean, what what do you really think their their motivation is? I mean, ego. It's ego. It's yeah. It's ego completely. 
or greed uh, really it's it's their concern the, that well in the case of uh, zuko um giacomo it's I, I think it's ego more so than greed or anything like that um he, he sees himself as as you know a an influencer he really uh, you know and and he feels he has this power and this sway and this this audience um and i don't think it's anything other than than just topping up that 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 uh dopamine mm. every once in a while you know um and i yeah i think that you know every subculture they have their their, their meeting places whether that be on irc or a slack channel or a telegram room you know whether it's in monero, monero or bitcoin whether it's samurai or any other project they all have that i think that this particular group of people maybe were in their their meeting place and kind of stoking each other up and and samurai's been on their shit list for a really long time like you know we're <laughs> we're not in the good graces as zuko came into our telegram room like last year at some point it, after he had written some really horrendous article on bitcoin privacy and he did not get the reception he had received in all the other telegram rooms he got he went into like people you know they basically they ran him out of the room they were savages and he's he's kind of held that on his shoulder for a long time against us. So, you know, we, we don't defer the the respect that these people think that they they just they deserve. You know, we we, we confer the respect that we feel like maybe they've earned. Um, and in his case and a lot of their cases, it's very little. So, you know, going to circling back to your original question, was it a hard decision? No, not at all. When you, when you, when you, to, when you matter so little, no, it doesn't, it's not a hard question because we're not just a Bitcoin wallet. Like that's, we're a privacy wallet. And if this tool provides privacy to our users and we can figure out a way that, um, that our users are going to benefit from it, then yeah, you're, you're sure as shit going to implement it. Of course, you know, it doesn't matter what they think. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I obviously love that answer. That that sounds great to me. How do you see what what is it going to look like? What is it going to feel like for the user? The the Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps on Samurai. Yeah. Well, it's still all up in the air. Uh, nothing has been built out into the wallet itself yet. Everything is on a command line program. Those swaps are occurring uh, on testnet, and I believe one has occurred on mainnet. Uh, but so so we're still in the works and still designing things and figuring out exactly how it's going to work. I think initially what we're thinking is just to test the waters uh, because, you know, atomic swaps are they're kind of like with they're kind of like coin joins, like liquidity is the name of the game. Right. Like if you don't have liquidity there on either side, then you're not going to have a great experience. That's that's where the centralized uh, swappers uh, you have your beat. Right. Like. They can do it much more smoothly than you can if if you have a very small liquidity base. So we gotta we're gonna start it slow, play play it slow, and um, I'll try to try to be brief here because it's kind of related to a specific functionality of Samurai Wallet. Uh, but when a user of Samurai Wallet enters into CoinJoin, uh, Whirlpool CoinJoin, um, there's a single UTXO that remains. Um, that hasn't been mixed, hasn't been coin joined, and is still related to the unmixed history of those coins. We call this toxic change. Um, and there's a couple things that a user can do with toxic change to mitigate the risks of accidentally linking it with some other UTXOs in their wallet, right? So Monero users, of course, are laughing at this whole this whole notion, but this is this is the reality of how it works in the, in Bitcoin. Um, so right now what the wallet does as a safeguard is automatically marks these UTX, these toxic UTXOs as do not spend, meaning the wallet won't use them to create transactions. They're just going to sit there and, and just not do anything, uh, until the user manually intervenes and decides what they want to do. Um, so we took away the, the most dangerous possibility in that it's accidentally combined with another UTXO in the wallet. Uh, the second thing that users do, uh, I do this myself occasionally, is use those UTXOs at like a, let's say something like a bit refill, which is a non KYC uh, gift card um, service, right? So you can take that toxic UTXO and turn it into like, I don't know, like a subway gift card and, you know, convert it into a sub. Right? Like that's one way of dealing with it. But the way that we found most of our users, I would say, 
gosh, probably around 60 to 70%, what they were doing was sending those toxic UTXOs into a custodial swap like Changely or one of XMR2 when it was when it was around and converting it into Monero and keeping it in their Monero wallet as Monero until they had, you know, roughly a large enough amount to go back into Whirlpool. Mm -hmm. um, so we figured, well, shit, if they're already doing that, right, and they're going, they're jumping through all these hoops and they're putting themselves in cust at custodial risk to do it, we should prioritize that as a oh, something we can fix, right? Like we can make it much more smooth to do that in a non-custodial fashion using atomic swap. So that's what we think we're going to do first. Oh, okay, um, that's interesting. So you saw that as there's already demand for yeah, for this yeah, atomic it's just swap. like a no-brainer. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just Justin, uh, who I'm sure you know, I think he was yeah. he, he interviewed. He had asked me to ask you that question. Actually, uh, I think uh, any rough es estimates of how much how much toxic uh, Bitcoin uh, is is sitting in people's wallets that maybe oh, go over gosh. there. That's a good question. I don't, I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I don't even. I'll have to ask some, uh, ask a few people on the team, uh, see if we can if we can kind of figure out that number. Because that's a really good question, uh, and come up with an estimate there. Um, but you know, we see we see hundreds uh, in, in many cases, hundreds of whirlpool mixes a day in the various pools, um, and a whirlpool mix takes two fresh UTXOs to trigger at least two fresh UTXOs, meaning there has to be incoming new liquidity coming in for those mixes to fire, meaning that there's going to be a toxic change UTXO for every one of those, for every, you know, for each of those two new participants coming in, you know, so the, I, there's, I'm pretty confident on the, the Bitcoin side of the liquidity, we're going to be able to provide quite a bit. Um, I don't know how popular or how desirable it's going to be on the Monero side for Monero users to swap and get Bitcoin. Um, at least now, I think it will be popular if, like I said, if there's delistings in the future. Uh, but we'll see. And that's why I want to take it slow with, with the liquidity. And we're talking about relatively small size UTXOs. Um, you know, because toxic change, the, the most it would be is. Um, 0 0.0009 yeah so very very small amounts yeah yeah i mean so you're talking maybe like uh, i think in fiat terms that's something like 80 or, or 90 bucks or something like that mm. yeah you know? it's it's not it's not enough you know it's not chump change it's you know right it's still yeah. something it's still yeah. something and it's just just enough to dip our toes in to see you know okay how and we know the demand is there on, on our side, but how is it going to work out with the demand on the Monero side? Um, how is that going to emerge? Is it going to like our market makers going to emerge in this kind of like we don't know? All the, the atomic swap stuff is just so new all around. Everyone is just kind of you know just has a big question mark over it. So we're we're excited. I mean, we're really happy to be doing it. Um, so you know, we're we're <laughs> we're just going to play it by ear in a lot of ways. Awesome. I mean, I, I hear all these things and, uh, you know, would like to go into, maybe go into some more detail on some of them. But like, you know, it, it all sounds a little a little scary to me. Right. So there, there's like uh, uh, there's the different there, you have Stonewall coin join. You have um, Whirlpool. Yep. You have Cahoots. You have uh, toxic toxic change is happening. So, I mean, why, why not? Why not just use Monero? I got to ask, like, why? You know, if somebody's has the the choice between using Bitcoin and and using it through Samurai, because that seems like the best way to use it in a in a cash like way, versus using Monero, why not just use Monero? I mean, Monero, you know, there's there's not much thought that goes into it. I'm not a very technical guy. Sure. Um, you know, I, I use a I, I use Cake Wallet. I know it's open source. Like you know, it's kind of like the bread wallet of of Monero. And uh, I know when I when I use it. Uh, it's it's protecting my privacy and my Monero is fungible and there's not much to think about. So sure. what what do you you know what's your your reasoning there as to why people should even be using Bitcoin in this way? 
versus using Monero? Well, well you know, I, I think people should use Monero uh, if they want to, if, they, if they're really into privacy. I mean, every, every, every privacy advocate who's, who I know in Bitcoin also uses Monero, right? It's not a either or for them. So I think they should use Monero. Uh, the, the, the fact is, though, the most people are using Bitcoin. That's where the people are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that for, for uh, when, it, when it comes to liquidity still, Bitcoin is the king. Uh, at, at a certain point with Monero, you know, if you have one of these ransomwares that, that they, they're asking for $500,000 in Monero, that's going to that's gonna eat in pretty deep into the order book. You know, that's a, that's a huge, huge chunk. Uh, where Bitcoin, that's just is, is absorbed in a, in a blink of an eye. Right. So I think it's uh, Monero is just still very niche. And I think that people, it's going to grow provided that it keeps its its fundamental proposition and provided that it keeps its spirit alive and the culture alive doesn't make a lot of the same mistakes that Bitcoin did in its community. I think it's going to grow and it'd be successful. But the more more people are going to be using Bitcoin. And our idea is that you know, whether it's they're not using Monero because they haven't heard of it, because they don't, they're just a simple person. They, they just got into Bitcoin. They can't, they can't, you know, stomach learning about something else right now, whatever the reasoning is. And there's, there's a whole wide spectrum. Uh, it, it's inconsequential to me because if they need privacy for whatever perceived reason, they, they need it. And we want to, we're there, we are, we're, we're building tools for it. Uh, if they're learning, if they're using Bitcoin and they need privacy and they stumbled into Samurai, they're going to learn about Monero because it's going to be something that's talked about in the community, but also something that starts appearing in the wallet in terms of the atomic swaps. Yeah, no, that that's great. Um, that's great to hear. And I, I, th I think it's, it's a, yeah, it's a very natural way for people to then learn about Monero. Because uh, they're, they're obviously they're coming to Samurai because they want the privacy, and then they're they're realizing uh, that one way of doing that is to to swap into Monero. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and and you know, and a lot of users, there's just so many. Bitcoin has such a wide user base now because of all of the different cycles, all the different pumps, um, and you have a whole spectrum of people. Um, but so you have a lot of you know you have a lot of the guys who are there for the, what are they, you know, the store of value guys. And, you know, Monero is just an unacceptable uh, compromise to them. Uh, they, uh, my understanding is limited, as I told you right at the beginning. I, I really don't keep up in these, these debates because they just don't interest me. But my understanding is that they, um, they, they can't audit something or other, or they don't believe they can audit the supply. And that's just a deal breaker because they're store of value guys. Right. Uh, so, you know, they wouldn't want to use Monero, but a lot of these guys, at least the ones who are Samurai users, have, have either said privately to us or have said it publicly on Twitter, but yeah, we understand the swap feature and, you know, maybe swapping into Monero for, uh, you know, five days or a week or, or a month and building up, you know, uh, my docs exchange and doing this and that and then coming back to Bitcoin, you know, so I think it's just, we can't think that the majority of users think in the way that these Twitter maxis think because they don't you know they really don't think that way most users mm -hmm. most users they, they're open they're receptive they want to learn and they're going they're there for privacy uh, to begin with because that's really what we are they wouldn't be there for any other reason in samurai um so they're already receptive to to uh the proposition that monero has in store for them yeah i think um yeah the whole audibility thing and the store of value uh you know, we, we, I don't need to go into it now, but, you know, there's, there's certainly arguments to be made that, you know, Monero is is essentially as audible as Bitcoin. It's just more abstract. Um, but I think, you know, Bitcoin has done a great job at being the, you know, uh, digital gold number go up. Uh, do you think monero can start to take on that meme as well like i see no reason why uh you know monero uh doesn't start to get used for those purposes as well i mean one of the things i look at you know obviously i'm a big believer in privacy um i i i it's what attracts me to monero this this power that you feel when you can 
you know, you spend your money without being stopped, without being censored, without being surveilled. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's really empowering. When I first used Bitcoin, it felt magical. Yep. Until I went and I looked it up on the blockchain and it, it was like, oh, cool. The transaction went through. And then I realized, wait, oh, the, the guy I just sent it to could also look that up. There's like that, everything. Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden, all that magic disappeared. I was like, this doesn't feel so magical anymore. Um, but do you think Monero can start to take on that that meme or that that use case of, of store of value as well? I mean, like, oh. like I guess the point I was getting to, you know, privacy aside, cash is fungible, gold is fungible. You know, uh, when when I when I read you know the arguments for why Bitcoin is digital gold, I, I very rarely see a section on fungibility and, and how. Bitcoin itself mimics that, um, you know, mimics the fungibility of gold. Uh, do you have any thoughts? I know you say you don't really follow it too closely in terms of the the, the tech the, the technicalities of it, but sure. just in terms of general fungibility, do you think that's essential to something that's going to be calling itself digital gold? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's, it's like it's a no brainer. <laughs> fungibility is an essential property of money. Yeah, you know, it has to be. Um, and, and I've said it numerous, numerous times, um, fungibility in the fiat world is enforced by a legislation, um, in, because it's, it's just a known, it's a known quality that money, good money has to have, uh, in the Bitcoin world, the crypto world, it can't be enforced via legislation. It has to be enforced, uh, by a software, by the protocol level, by that type of, uh, by, by code ultimately. Uh, and as I said earlier in the podcast, you know, when I got into Bitcoin, the ex expectation was that fungibility would be a priority for developers, right? Like it, it wasn't just something that was stagnant and, and that was it. Bitcoin was done. It was, you know, we know where the, the, pit, the, the pitfalls are. We know where the improvements need to be made. We, we know that right now, uh, pseudonymity anonymity is, is okay. It's acceptable because largely KYC doesn't exist in Bitcoin uh, and no real entities exist in Bitcoin. Okay. And then, you know, things change. That's no longer the case, but everything got, you know, stayed the same since that point. Uh, and we don't, we, we see no efforts uh, towards fungibility at the protocol level. Um, you see efforts, you know, at a non default level and there's, you know, there's efforts are, are essential, but it will never be as strong as a default fungibility system, right? Or a default fungibility level. But yep, that's just, again, something that you have to live with when that's what Bitcoin is. That's just how it is. Now, the, sec the, the other part of your question is, can Monero be the, the store of value coin? I mean, it's possible. Uh, you could say you're anything. I, I don't think it's advisable, though. I think, that, I think that Monero should be very strongly focused on privacy uh, and and not focus on number go up um because that brings that brings with it a lot of a lot of ills in the community and a lot of ills in the culture of the community um and i've actually started mm -hmm. to see the beginnings of this building in monero community wise um and it's something to be wary of but what have you the, what have you seen well, the there was a, a it was we can call it ill fated because it doesn't seem to have taken off, which is a good sign. But there was an attempt um, at a regulatory bridge kind of organization. I believe they called themselves Comply First. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. And you know whether it was absurd or not, the fact is it emerged, mm -hmm. uh, and and there was support from from you know respected people these, you know, these guys aren't these guys are you know in the community they're not idiots they're not dummies or anything but this is an idea that emerged and got far it was allowed to get far enough to be presented to the community mm. um and it's uh, to me that's the beginning of a sign you know because i remember but you were opposed to that i mean because the idea there was you know to help uh get monero added to exchanges to basically you know let these right. guys 
know but that like, Monero technically should be allowed to be on an exchange. Why? Why are you? All that, yeah, yeah. I've heard it all before. I've seen it yeah. all before with Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I remember okay. when Coin uh, when Coin Center was launched. Again, they were they were launched as yeah. We're just going to explain, you know, what a private key is, and we're just going to explain what this. And then the, you know now we're we're coming up. We're we're writing the regu- they're writing the regulations with the with the regulators and right. saying hey look. Thank God we were here, or else it would have been really bad. You know, like the, that's the road you're going down. I, I don't deny that the intentions are pure, uh, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? That's what they say. Mm. Uh, so I would, I would just be very cautious of that. I would not desire number go up. I would not go looking for it. I would, you know, just like you know, when Bitcoin goes up, I, I everyone likes their their Bitcoin you know increasing in value tonight it's fun to look at but i you know it doesn't it doesn't phase me when it goes down it doesn't phase me when it goes sideways um and it's just it's it's not the most important metric uh by any by any stretch and i think that what you'll find is if if monero focuses on being you know truly the best private money uh truly private and, and continues to innovate on that front they'll find that you know the market rewards them in terms of market price because that there's a strong demand for that mm-hmm. it'll know? just it'll just increase demand and the simple supply and demand at that point right because right. You, there's you, there's something to it you know mm-hmm. there's a product that people want and they'll they'll use bitcoin to get it they'll use whatever to get it if they can't use fiat to get it if they can't use whatever on an exchange to get it They'll get it still because that's the type of product it is, mm-hmm. you know. So I think that when you got something good, you, they, it pretty much sells itself, and you don't have to, you don't have to go and comply first, quote unquote. You know, what we say, we like to say at Samurai is, um, and we we had it printed on T-shirts for goodness sake, is asking permission is seeking denial. Um, right, right, so right. don't ask for permission; just do it, and, and don't and, even ask for forgiveness. Yeah, don't even don't bother with that. There's there's, there's no future in it. <laughs> well, I gotta say I disagree with you a little bit there. Only well, bad name, right? Comply first isn't really a great name for uh, yeah, you know, a cypherpunk movement. I think like you like you said, you know, it doesn't matter what the intentions are. It could be a step in the wrong direction ultimately, but you know, it's it's this chicken and egg problem, right? So. You know, in in talking, as we were talking, one of the issues you you kind of brought up with Monero is the fact that it's it's doesn't have enough liquidity. So it's like, well, how do we get there? How does it obtain enough liquidity? And you know, I, I obviously atomic swaps is going to be tremendous, decentralized exchanges, but you know, I think um, that really is Monero's biggest hurdle right now is obtaining liquidity so it can meet. Uh, it's you know uh, it's demand right so yeah uh, you know ransomware hackers you know would ideally be asking for a Monero but it's you know maybe not liquid enough in some cases obviously you know all right I'm not saying ransomware hacking is good but it's showing that there's right. this potentially great demand for for Monero uh, but because it's it's lacking some liquidity it may you know it may not be being used. So how do we, you know, get over that liquidity issue? How did how how is that going to happen? It's just going to come with time. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think so. Because um, Bitcoin I, I, got I, over it with number go up, right? It's store value, uh, um, number go up, number go up, number go up, and you know, before you know it, it market cap is was large enough where the liquidity was there for whatever you wanted to use it for. I, I mean, I think I think Bitcoin was building liquidity even before the the, the big craze, the number growth mm-hmm. craze. Um, I think you know after every cycle. So even after the cycle from like a hundred to a thousand, um, it always it always retained and ended ended higher. And and I think I don't know that it's it's all to do with the latest like the or the most the more recent big big run ups. Um, in terms of Bitcoin's liquidity, I think a lot of it was organically grown in the early days. Um, so from like 2009 to 2011, 2012, it was still very much uh, a peer-to-peer uh, merchant-led type of operation. It didn't really stick. It didn't last, uh, but it was enough to get it into the 
just the, the fringe of the public consciousness, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was still very fringe, but you know, it was, it was known enough by enough people. Um, Monero hasn't quite had that luxury yet. I think that, you know, whenever Monero is mentioned, it's just tied to crime, you know, as Bitcoin was in its early days. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, I believe that Monero does work, right? I believe that it is a, a, a uh, effective tool and, and, a, and a good uh, privacy point. I believe all that uh, based on what I've seen, my limited knowledge and use. Uh, and if that, I also believe that if that's true, then ultimately the, the state, the government, in particular the US government, won't let it live in the clean market, in the, in the white market, meaning the exchanges, ultimately, with time. Um, they'll figure out a way whether, you know, you can argue the semantics and say, well, technically it should be allowed because this, that, and the other. Uh, but, you know, that's just your argument, semantics with the entity that's way more powerful than you and, and in many ways has no accountability to you. Um, Come on, man, you don't believe in the constitution? Well, I believe it. Ex <laughs> I believe it exists. It hasn't done a. It hasn't done a. It doesn't have a great track record of reigning in uh, out of control government. Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, I it's agree. a nice. You know, it's a nice idea. Um, yeah, I, I'm an Articles of Confederation guy personally. You know, the, the Constitution <laughs> just let it all go downhill. This is where you end up with, a, with just a little bit of federalism. But you, you you think like so even in the U.S. we get to you know we get to the point where. They don't. Hold. I think it. I don't think it would be. I don't think it would, they would even need to do it by law. I just think it would be pressure. I think that enough mm -hmm. pressure could be exerted on the U.S. based exchanges to make it so they don't. Uh, they don't list it, or if mm -hmm. they've already listed it, to delist it because they're worried about X, Y, Z. You know, like it's. It doesn't really matter. I don't. I don't think they have to be ham fisted about it. Mm -hmm. But I. I believe that if it if it truly works and it truly starts to gain traction. There's no way in hell they're going to leave that there for people to to so freely and easily obtain. Yeah, I, well, I, I Justin has made the point, and I, I I like to believe he might be right with this idea. Well, at least you you know you'll have some heuristics on who's trying to obtain Monero if you're you know guarding the on ramps as opposed to just pushing it into darkness and the only people that are using it and are and obtaining it are doing it through you know anonymous ways through atomic swaps and things like that what what do you think of that argument so this idea that you know governments may ultimately want people to get their monero through a kyc aml exchange versus them obtaining it through anonymous means yeah well one i think for any monero person or group, and I, you know, I like Justin to be um, suggesting this as a proposition is completely fucked up. You know, like I think that they need to really seriously think about what they're saying and who they're saying it to. Mm. Um, but, but I, I, I just think it's naive thinking, uh, you know, primarily when a criminal actor, um, if they're, if they're going to be using Monero, and let's say it's, it's liquid enough to, to use for their purposes. Their goal generally isn't to hold the Monero, right? Their, their goal is to cash out their, their illicit gains. And mm. that's, that's where law enforcement can really, well, that's where they get them. You know, and they get them on the on-ramp and the off-ramp. Now with Monero, okay, you've given them a heuristic that so-and-so bought Monero, but if Monero works, that doesn't, that's, there's nothing there. That's, that's nothing. You need to catch them, the criminal element on the off ramp. Mm -hmm. And where are they going? Well, probably into Bitcoin. And if you're a state actor, you want your criminal activity happening on the Bitcoin blockchain. It's way easier to track than cash, and it's way easier to track than Monero, and it's way easier to track, you know, uh, and the criminals aren't going to be using the banking network, generally, or the SWIFT network for the most part, right? So, Bitcoin's a pretty good bet because they're most likely not going to be using Samurai. They're most likely not going to be, they're going to be using defaults on, you know, popular apps. And that, that gives them the foothold. So 
you know, I, I don't think the on ramp heuristic, whatever argument is, is all that compelling uh, to to uh, entities who are having to de- will have to deal with uh, investigating the criminal activity, the criminal element, whether on Bitcoin or Monero. Uh, mm. I think they would they that's, you know, if, if, if again, this is my assumption is Monero works and it works effectively and well, meaning that there is a very little incentive for investigators to get people onto or let people go onto Monero at all, right? Because that's contrary to what they want. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, that's just the way I see it. And, and, and personally, I mean, uh, again, I'm not invested in Monero. I, I have a little bit, like I, like I said, from doing these, these uh, custodial swaps and testing things out. But uh, if I was in the Monero, uh, an active, you know, member of the Monero community, I would, I would just learn to love it, learn to embrace it, you know, be happy that you're there right now, but understand that, you know, you're probably going to be delisted. And if that happens, that is a total, total endorsement. You know, that is them saying like, we, you're too dangerous to be allowed for general public consumption. And what, what better way to drive use than tell people you can't have it? Oh yes. The the Streisand effect, right? Right. I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, but you know, part part of me, you know, want, wants it to be accessible to to the world. At the you know, at the end of the day, it is digital cash. I'm I'm okay with people obtaining it through uh, KYC AML exchanges if that's all they're really capable of doing. And you know, at least they're getting digital cash. What they what they do with it afterwards is. Uh, is protected right it's like going to the bank you know you take out your 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 thousand dollars cash and you use it as you wish bank knows you took out that thousand bucks but they don't know what you did with it afterwards i mean so i'm not not opposed to uh you know traditional on ramps existing for monero i think i think it's you know i think that's a good thing too but i hear what you're saying that you you, inevitably you think they're going to try to squash that yeah, well, I mean, fundamentally, I'm, I'm very, very much opposed to KYC and AML. Oh, I um, hate the idea of it, but yeah, you know. right. You know, I've always called it a, a creeping disease because you know the, I'm old enough to remember being able to walk into a, a bank and open an account with nothing more than just saying, "Hey, I want to open an account. Here's my name. You know, here's my address, and that's it." That was the end of it. You yeah. know, and and you know things changed i'm not that old and things change very rapidly right? we just like, went to open up a bank account for monero talk llc it's and a it nightmare like, man it's, it's ridiculous oh my god i was like <laughs> i was ready to leave the country i was like what, what is, like, i felt like i was being violated in every it's way absolutely possible insane right yeah and I, I mean i remember when that wasn't like that at all you know yeah. and uh so kyc it, it, it's it's creeping it, it happens very quickly um, well, it, it happens quickly, but it, it's easy to not notice, right? It's mm-hmm. easy just to kind of go, ah, you know, that's just how it is. We don't mind it. That's just how it goes now. And that's why we are opposed to it is because if you just let it in a little bit, it's going to spread. So, mm-hmm. uh, you, of course, it can't be stopped. You're, you know, it's gonna, it's, there are going to be on-ramps into the space, uh, you know, that are regulated in this and that if they're allowed to be, right, uh, right. assuming that it's not delisted. Or you know, for whatever reason, a uh, band or uh, unlikely as it is, right? Um, but but I don't think it should be encouraged or or um, or anything like that. I think that you know, like in the early days of Bitcoin, it was a lot of peer to peer stuff, meetups, and oh, you, you wanted to get Bitcoin, you had to know a guy who had Bitcoin and wanted to sell some. And and I think that it's easier these days to find people who have Monero, and it's easier to find people who have Bitcoin who who are willing to sell and. It's unfortunate that those mechanisms haven't been further developed because of all of the easy and convenient KYC on ramps. Um, they exist, so people use them, and it takes away development from the potential innovations that kind of occurred in terms of private interactive trades. Um, yeah. With people. No. You know, then who knows what could have happened? Like, but it, has, it hasn't been developed yet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. There. I mean, it, it's it's ushering atomic swaps is, you know, it's people are in, you know, there's a great need for it. Now, well, it's right? a start. Like, that's the beginning of it, right? Like, right. yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, it's very early, of course, but that's that's really the true kind of start and beginning of this entirely 
just separate economy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've given, I think I gave, I don't, it was another, a lot of the Monero podcasts invited me to talk to way more than the Bitcoin ones. And it was on one <laughs> of the um, Monero podcasts I won. It wasn't Justin's, I don't think. Maybe it was one where there was two guys together. I gave a presentation um, called, um, Gosh, it was uh, building a digital safe haven. Oh, I watched that video because I was doing, right. doing research on you today. Yeah, I think that was uh, Justin's as well, I think. Okay, it was Justin. It was, I believe there was another guy, but yeah, it was Justin and someone else. Uh, oh, and, Rerar, maybe Rerar. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. so, it, um, uh, you know, so I gave that presentation and that's really what it's the start of, right? It's like building the, the that digital safe haven, that digital Switzerland yes. um, of old. Uh, the, the, the early beginning, you know, building blocks, but building blocks on the left. Awesome, man. Yeah, no, that, that was a great, uh, talk you did. And, uh, uh, thank you. It made, you know, what you had to say certainly made me excited. So, so were you always like that? Did you always have this mentality, uh, even before you discovered crypto and discovered Bitcoin or these things you you were already thinking about these kind of cypherpunk ideals and then crypto came about and you're like oh out well, there it is or was it, it was, that crypto came about and then you 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 learned about the cypherpunk ideas from it no it was it was before yeah it was before crypto it was before Bitcoin um, but not not too much before um, mm -hmm. I actually I went you know, it's a common story, but uh, I had heard about Bitcoin early in, in I think, probably 09 or 010. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, 2000, yeah. And through, and that was through uh, libertarian kind of uh, voluntarism subreddits where yeah. they were kind of bringing those kind of that idea up and talking about it. But it didn't it didn't catch me. Um, so I, I ignored it and I was more into precious metals at the time. So I was already into uh, gold and silver, and I ignored Bitcoin and stacked silver instead. <laughs> you know, so now I have I have literal bags <laughs> that I'm holding <laughs> from like the high of the silver <laughs> market. Have you ever been to Porkfest? Uh, no, no, I haven't been. Um, we just came. I had friends and and, and okay. contacts. Yeah, yeah, we went to that. It was about two. This was my first time. I was it was amazing. It was cool. like yeah. a libertarian dream come true. And uh, Monero was definitely alive and well and yeah, kicking ass sure. over there. I like, bet. I bet it was. You yeah. know, like you said, in, in its purest form, just peer to peer. You know, everybody using it for whatever they wanted to. Uh, you know, it was it was great to see. It was like, wow, this is this is what we should be aiming for here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. No, I haven't I haven't been to Portrait, but I would I would like to like to attend and uh yeah. What was the sorry, what was the uh the question I lost my train of thought. Oh, so yeah, sorry, I was interrupting you there. Uh, I was just asking you, like, so, you know, so did you have these ideas, oh, of, yeah. these cypherpunk yeah, ideas before crypto, or did you yeah. learn them along the way? No, so I mean, it, it kind of came from a little bit before, and I, I was probably, I was pretty young when I kind of got the political bent uh, in terms of the way I kind of think about things and the the desire for the least amount of state intervention. I. I guess is the best way of describing it. And that was, I mean, I was probably 16 or something. And I read, um, I read Bastiat, uh, the law and that like completely, completely like fundamentally changed my perception of, of, of reality. You know, and it's just a short little pamphlet written by Frederick Bastiat in 1856 France. And I just couldn't, I think it was 1856. I might be a little off on that date, but I just couldn't believe how, um, relevant, and, and pressing it was and that kind of just started me on the course in terms of wanting to separate myself from the long strong arm of the state and figuring that the best way to achieve that um was through the money because if you don't have monetary freedom if you don't have freedom to transact you don't have anything you know that's a fundamentally you know i do uh, the freedom to transact, the ability to transact freely as a as a freedom of speech. 100%. You know, so it, it's just such a fundamental. Uh, and then that's at that, that point, uh, I think, is when it kind of, when Bitcoin itself clicked for me. And I was like, okay, if we can make that, this technology that, then I, I get it. I'm in. That's really what, my, like, what the journey, how that started. 
<laughs> well, I mean, that, that's, and that's what it was supposed to be, right? I mean, do you think, yeah. do you think Satoshi, um, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's pseudonymous, right? So, I mean, do you, do you think that was the design choice or just that the technology wasn't there at the time to, to make it something more like Monero at that point? Or do you think he just felt like it, it needed to be done that way so people could learn to trust the system? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. You know, I'm I'm, de I'm definitely not one of these guys that like pours over Satoshi's you know writings and emails and tries to like get into his head and stuff like that. Uh, but my my general feeling, uh, my intuition says it was it's a kind of a little bit of, of both. It's one I don't you know I don't think the tech and the the problem Satoshi was solving was so were so big by themselves, you know, in terms of consensus, in terms of the Byzantine general problem, in terms of just these concepts and that had plagued uh, the cypherpunks for a long time in terms of completing the the digital cash ecosystem, right? Like the, Bitcoin is the, the product of years of progression, right? From, uh, you know, uh, B money to uh, E gold to all, you know, all this stuff that finally cultivated into into Bitcoin, um, I don't think the tech was there or the understanding of how to do it was there. And I don't. And even if it was there, and he did have that understanding, perhaps you're right, and perhaps it was maybe that was just a step too far, right? How could he get people to sign, like, to even understand and and want to uh, listen about this system if they're unable to even, for example, audit the number of coins that are in the system, right? Like. It was such a, I, don't, I mean, it's hard to, hard to explain because it was getting your head around Bitcoin for the first time uh, that it was explained to you back in those early days was very difficult. People found it incredibly difficult. Whereas now, like, you can explain an NFT and, like, someone gets it just because they understand <laughs> that that's just the world now. You know, I don't know. So the concepts of brown Bitcoin at that time were just so revolutionary that I don't think it would have been uh, taken up as a technology so so readily if he even had the understanding of how to make it private at the get-go. So sorry about that, man. No, no problem. Um, this is why I canceled yesterday. I'm like dying. I don't know what I – I think it's uh, just bad allergies or something. Uh, sorry to hear it. Um, dude, I want to hear the rest of that rant. That was uh... – can you pick up where you were going? Actually, I didn't notice that you got up and left. So oh, okay. Good, good. <laughs> I, gave, I gave you the sign because I was coughing. I just had, I had to put it on you. <laughs> I didn't, you know, it's, it's on, my, on my phone, so it's okay. really small. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I basically you were saying perhaps it is that he, he wanted to uh, keep it transparent so people could see what was going on under the hood. Right? Is that, is that yeah, true? yeah. Basically, you know, I think like I like I was saying, like you know, these days you can kind of like talk to a, like a grandma about an NFT, and there's like some sort of fundamental understanding of what that is, even though there no one really understands it. But back then, when you were talking, like even like technical person, to like, I'm talking about 2009, 2010, when you're trying to like onboard them and explain Bitcoin to them, it was it was a, you know, a mind fuck and it was a big, big hurdle to get over mm -hmm. the concept that you could distribute trust in this way. The concept that there's no intermediary, like it was just a lot of, it was big. So if Satoshi had the understanding of how to make Bitcoin anonymous, let's just assume that he had that understanding. I think it's possible and you know, not, I won't say likely, but I think it's possible that he might've said actually, I think it will be 10 times harder to convince people of the system with this layer on top of it because they won't even really be able to peer into the system. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's feasible. Um, whether, whether or not he had the, the understanding of how to do it is a whole other question. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, so obviously, said you said you you use Monero. You know, it's one of, one of your tools in your tool tool belt. Uh, you're obviously supportive of Monero. Um, when you made that choice in the you know in the earlier days when you decided to work on Samurai, I mean, Monero existed, but I guess you said you didn't really 
Uh, you saw it more as a copy copycat project at the time. You didn't realize it was its own kind of its well, own no. thing. Uh, yeah, it existed. It, I remember when it sprung up, uh, or at least kind of got a lot of attention around it. Um, so it started to exist, but we we were already involved in Bitcoin. You know, we were mm -hmm. already uh, built, started careers in 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 the Bitcoin industry, and and probably had already started talking about Samurai, and even if it wasn't fully formulated yet. Mm -hmm. um, we did, so we didn't actually think of it as just a copycat in like kind of a derogatory way. It was just that was our understanding of all altcoins, right? Because right. Lightning was was Bitcoin, <clears throat> just with values changed, and all of the uh, almost all of the altcoins were that. So mm -hmm. I just just assumed that that was what Monero was as well. Um, the fact that it was focused on privacy immediately was compelling to us. Because uh, that's what we were focused on. So, like I said, our one of our early, our very early discussions was, well, since they're focused on privacy, let's use their chain to hop in and hop out in a round robin type of, uh, you know, transaction. Um, assuming that it was a copycat of Bitcoin, and we could just do that very easily within our Bitcoin wallet. Um, mm -hmm. Once we actually looked into it, and I, I, I'm pretty sure we talked to. We had discussions with Fluffy at that time, and and some other uh, some other devs about it. Cause we were serious about doing it, um, and we realized, oh no, this is like a serious thing. This isn't a, a copycat. This is its own tech. This has its own like the node requirements. We mm -hmm. won't be able to. We won't be able to to, to do <clears throat> this at least not yet. Uh, so we just you know we shelved it. But so yeah, we've always been supportive in that way. Uh, but also, you know, we've always our, our focus and our passions on Bitcoin. So, you know, we're going to focus on making a Bitcoin wallet because that's what we know about. You know, I, I've used Monero, you know, but I, I'm not a Monero user. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't I don't know what Monero users need. Um, mm -hmm. I know what Bitcoin users need. So that's why. I, and I wouldn't do a multi coin wallet because I just think it, it makes a wallet less. Uh, well, just to put it bluntly less good uh i think if we were ever to do a monero wallet it would be a standalone wallet you know like it has to be its own thing i don't i don't like mm. mixing coins and wallets would you guys consider doing a monero wallet is that something that's uh, no it, it, it hasn't even it hasn't even been discussed it, it would be uh it's just not something that's even feasible at this point we're completely mm -hmm. you know we're completely overwhelmed with our current workload on bitcoin yeah yeah, I mean, I get the question. I guess I was getting at was, you know, uh, why why didn't you then just decide to go into Monero and work on the Monero project? I mean, obviously, I'm th I'm sitting here. I'm thankful that you did it because I, you know, I think ultimately uh, you're going to be uh, a very valuable bridge between the Bitcoin and Monero community. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it's great that it ended up this way. But just personally, I, I'm just curious as to why you know, perhaps you didn't get more involved in the Monero project itself, um, seeing how, how much it aligns with uh, your ideals there. Well, you know, it's a good question. And uh, I, I think a lot of it comes down to that, that there's a problem to solve on Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I Samra is not just like a wallet, right? Like it's a tool to, that solves a problem. And I like that. I like building stuff that solves a problem uh, that, you know, that uses various functionalities, has a, a various stack, but it ultimately there's an overarching, you know, problem statement that's getting solved. And I don't know that, you know, what, what we could offer to Monero is probably a, a really nice Monero wallet, but there's already really nice Monero wallets, you know, like how many really nice Monero wallets do you need? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so it seems like you guys have, are well served in that regard, right? Like the only areas that I see for like besides protocol development, of course, and that's we're just not protocol developers; we're application developers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So besides, so besides that, the only area for innovation that I can see in Monero right now are like um, either consumer-facing services and, and figuring out ways of of creating a sustainable business on, on you know, getting people to spend their Monero at your service regularly, mm -hmm. um, or uh, which is tough at, at any you know in any market, but at, in crypto it's, it's a tough thing to, to do. Um, 
or coming up with like uh, you know interfacing into the fiat world, which we have absolutely zero interest in. But if you if that's what your interest is, there's opportunity in Monero to do that. Um, there's big opportunity. So, but yeah, so we don't. Our interest is in there. Our interest is in in solving the this privacy problem. And Bitcoin has a privacy problem. Uh, and not only do can we solve the problem and it's a challenge, but also we can we can build a business around that because mm -hmm. there's enough. There's enough demand for privacy, and Bitcoin isn't offering it uh, by default. So we can we can put, go insert ourselves there, and say, well, we can offer that. You know, at least here are the, uh, we can offer that at some level anyway. Here are, mm -hmm. your here are the trade-offs, but that's opportunity. So I mean, that, I think that's the fundamental reason. Otherwise, I I, I probably would have burnt out a long time ago, um, and just like <clears throat> completely disappeared from the space because. If I wasn't if I wasn't building these tools, I would be completely dismayed with what I've seen in Bitcoin. Well, ultimately, I'm very happy that you went in the direction you did because I, I do think you're you're kind of building a bridge there between the two projects, and that's that's very important. Uh, you I, you have the respect of the Bitcoin community, and you have the respect of the Monero community, so uh, you're you're playing an important role there. Well, thank you. Yeah, I I, I mean I think that. We're such a small. The privacy community is so small anyway that you know there, it makes no sense to to kind of separate ourselves into these little camps. Like we're here for privacy. Uh, yeah, we're using the money that we're using is Bitcoin. The money that you're using is Monero, right? Okay, we can argue, you know, over and over again. Well, why don't you use my money? It's way better for privacy, and you you like privacy. Well, why don't you use my money? It's more you know uh, auditable. Blah blah blah. Who, who gives a shit? We're here for privacy, right? And we should be able to obtain privacy uh, in whatever money we choose to use, um, mm -hmm. whatever crypto we're choosing to use. And as, as a community, our, our focus and care should be on maximizing sovereignty and privacy. Uh, and atomic swaps are one way that both communities can work together um, on a feature that does exactly those things. Awesome, man. I'd say let's end it there, but I, I do have one more question. Um, All right. <laughs> what do you got? Um, so CoinJoin or just, you know, the ways in which you can use Samurai. Um, is how, how untraceable is it? I mean, is there, you know, because there's still a history there, right? I mean, is it known that the coins that are used after a CoinJoin came from a CoinJoin? Is it, is it, are, can they essentially be tainted as as bitcoins that were were that went through a coin join or some other process on samurai i mean because you're uh, not you're not deleting the history like monero there is no history right so with bitcoin right. so, there's so always, not, there will there will always be a history so obviously right. you're scrambling that history but you could still be marked as somebody who essentially uh appears to be somebody that's trying to scramble their history Correct. So yeah, th there's various guarantees of of coin join. Well, I should say whirlpool because unfortunately not all coin join is created equal. Uh, but I can speak definitively on whirlpool, and so there's certain guarantees of whirlpool. Uh, one of those guarantees of whirlpool is that there is um, a complete uh, and total disassociation from previous history, previous inputs. Uh, and a coin history to the that UTXO and what happens once it enters the coin join process. Um, those that new history, uh, like you said, nothing gets deleted. You can't delete history in, in the blockchain, but the, the there's no there's no way you could associate the new UTXO to a targeted UTXO that went into the mixer, right? So. Example being, you have a sanctioned UTXO. You've walked, you follow it into the mixer. You there's nothing. There's no way that you could associate what comes out of the mixer to that UTXO. Every UTXO that comes out of the mixer can trace itself back to the first UTXO that went into the mixer when we launched it. So that's how the fungibility of the the mixing pool is maintained. Right, it's not it, it, because it, it's maintained through the fact that every UTXO in the pool could be that first the, related to those first UTXOs that came into the pool when in the first Genesis mix. Um, 
the larger your mixing pool, the better, of course, right? And that's so that's why we're tracking the uh, the amount of unspent UTXO, the amount of BTC that's unspent within the pool, uh, which just hit, I think, 3,200 BTC uh, today. Uh, that number is really important because the more the more BTC that are in that pool, the more potential participants that your UTXOs can be a part of, yeah. right? So th that's the type of guarantee. So now the second part of your question is, can't the um, targeting entity, whether that be an exchange or chain analysis or state act or whomever, see that you've done that process? And the answer is emphatically yes. There is an on-chain fingerprint to to equal output coin join. Uh, so it is a very obvious fingerprint on chain that mixing and coin join has occurred. Um, the the legal situation is that you know coin join at least in the U.S. is 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 legal. You know there's no there's nothing illegal about it. Users are entirely entitled to to use this type of tool. It's just a collaborative transaction. Um, it gets iffy if you're providing coin join services and taking custody, then you're a money transmitter uh, and you need you better have a money transmission license. Uh, but if you're not taking custody, you're just a software provider. And of course, that's what we are. We're just providing the software that allows users to create these transactions with each other. Um, we're not facilitating the transactions themselves, um, you know. So on the, from the legal side of things, there's no there's no issue. And from a practical point of view, we haven't seen any exchanges actively discriminating against coin join transactions currently. So we haven't actually seen that in practice. What we have seen is exchanges discriminating against bad coin join transactions. Uh, so the probably the most popular non custodial mixing software is Wasabi Wallet on Bitcoin. Uh, and due to many severe flaws in the architecture of that mixing client, um, a lot of their users' coins were flagged by exchanges for being in close proximity to either OFAC sanctioned addresses or uh, known criminal addresses or UTXOs, which, you know, if you're putting your coins through a mixer, you shouldn't have any association to any anything right like you should be getting fresh coins so the fact right. that that is happening makes no sense it's a it's a flaw in the mixer um that still unfortunately hasn't been rectified um but you know that's a whole other story uh but if the if the coin joint is done properly then then actually i my my understanding or my feeling currently is that the exchanges are quite happy to accept them because it does give them the protection because they're still applying the same chain analysis heuristics that they're applying to all their other transactions that are coming in, except these coins have absolutely zero links or associations to anything that the exchange can get in trouble for. There is no links to anything because they're, they're, they're a properly coin joined coin. And the exchange isn't in the business of chain analysis, right? The exchange is in the business of buying and selling Bitcoin. Chain analysis is a cost of doing business. It's a regulatory burden that they have to endure, right? So they're not going to, they're not looking to go above and beyond on some regulatory adventure here. They just want to get the check mark and get that person trading so they can extract fees from that person. That's mm -hmm. the ultimate goal of the exchange. So my belief right currently is the situation is, Exchanges are quite happy to accept a properly uh, coin joined UTXO because it doesn't tick any negative proximity boxes. It doesn't tick any negative uh, indicators to them. If, if in the future things change, the situation changes, and the fingerprint of a coin join is enough to condemn a whole transaction, we do have other tools that uh, we could deploy, right? We have other types of coin joins that have zero fingerprint at all. They just like look like absolutely normal transactions. Um, hmm. And we can deploy those. Uh, we have, like I told you earlier in the podcast, Ricochet, which is just a very, very simple distance builder, right? So at what point does the exchange decide that your coins are no longer too close to coin join coins? Is it six hops? Is it seven hops? Is it eight hops? 
okay, well, we can add six to eight hops of history in between. Right. You know, so it just becomes that, 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 you, uh, that game. Yeah. I mean, you just had me think like, so then I, I totally hear what you're saying, you know, exchanges are the exchange business, you know, but so, so then isn't that all so that all good reason as to why they would want to uh, accept Monero and have Monero on their exchange, right? Cause now it's, they don't even have to worry about looking at histories cause there is no history. Right. So it's like, yeah, um, I, I think the exchanges do want Monero. Absolutely. But exchanges you're saying want, there'll be regula regulatory pre pressure, government, pre like they may not. Yeah. Monero may not be banned, but there may be governments may be telling them whatever through letters, uh, you know, we, we yeah, rather you don't. Channels. Right. Back so, all right. Which may also then happen with things like coin joins. Right. So saying like we don't want to see any, uh, you know, any it's coins. Right. Yeah, it's definitely possible. That's why I said when, if and when the situation changes. So I, I can only go by what the situation has been, what it currently is, and then we we can think about what what is likely to occur in the future. Right. And I think it it is likely to occur at some point in the future that the discrimination of UTXO is based on the uh, coin join fingerprint. I think that that's pretty pretty much going to happen at some point in the future. Um, and, 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 you know, it probably happens today on very, very limited basis, uh, overzealous people or wh whomever. Um, and like I said, they, when that time happens, we do have tools in, uh, currently in the wallet and tools we can deploy that aren't currently in the wallet to, to deal with those. You know, every, every single action that the, they take in terms of ramping up their surveillance or ramping up their, their um yeah, you know, restrictions for us is just another market opportunity because if we can figure out a way to bypass them, we can monetize it because users will will pay for it. You know, so it's kind yeah. of it's it's a, it's a great incentive model. You know, like we're not in it for the money or anything. We just want to keep the lights on and the servers running. But if you get to fuck with the people that like you you've made your enemy, <laughs> you know, like and, and get paid do it to do it. It's kind of you know it's kind of awesome. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is there any fear? I mean, so at the end of the day, you know, uh, Samurai Wallet, it's an app, you know, in different forms. It's not this self-propelling protocol. It's it's not Bitcoin. It's not Monero. Uh, is there any fear that Samurai could be shut down, or that there's risk with the fact that it's it's centralized essentially through you guys? You know, it, it's definitely a risk. Um, it's one of the first risks we identified, you know, and it's part of the reasons we decided to stay, um, yeah, using our um, our handles and being anonymous as possible mm. to avoid uh, as much attention in our our you know real life identities. Um, you know, we we're, we're lucky to be able to uh, you know do what we're doing full time. Um, we're lucky to be able to hire legal representation to make sure that you know, we're, we're not doing anything that's going to get us thrown into a jail cell. Um, we're lucky to be able to, to just straddle that line and just make sure that, that the, the regulatory environment and wherever we happen to be at the time uh, is conducive to what we're doing and understanding that we may have to relocate, uh, may have to there's a lot of things we may have to do at the at a moment's notice to make sure that we we're, we're staying you know on the right side of things like uh, you know for example we we were based in the UK for a long time and ended up relocating um, in 2019 because the uh, they were implementing the uh, fifth money laundering directive the EU's money laundering directive and that made or at least at the time the draft that we understood to be close to final. Uh, would have made it a crime to offer the services that we were offering. Uh, it didn't matter that we were non-custodial, that we actually didn't take custody at all. The, the regulation didn't accommodate for that, uh, that use case, that software use case. Uh, and we, we left the, the country, <laughs> you know, we got out uh, because it just wasn't going to be conducive to what we were doing. Uh, ultimately, they ended up changing the, the, the text to make a, an exception for non-custodial but uh, I guarantee you, by the sixth or seventh one of these, that's not that's going to be gone. You know, <laughs> so. right, right, right. 
All right, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for putting oh, up with, uh, the technical difficulties here. My pleasure, man. It was a good. It was a good one. I think it's going to be nice. Uh, how yeah. long does it usually take before you uh, publish them? Uh, we'll get this out in a few uh, next week. We'll, you know, like, oh, awesome. Yeah, cool. yeah, like five days. We'll probably get it out there. All right, buddy. Uh, where, so, yeah, where, can, where can people find you? I, uh, if you want to just throw out some information there, you know, where where can they learn more about you? Learn more about Samurai? Sure. I, th- I mean, the best place um, would be to go to our website, samuraiwallet.com. Uh, Samurai spelled S-A-M-O-U-R-A-I wallet.com. And you can also find me on Twitter at the same handle, Samurai Wallet. Nope. Did we lose it? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought we lost yeah, it for There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, uh, we're also on Telegram as well. We have a very active um, Telegram community. Uh, so... Find us, uh, find us anywhere, and okay. and say hi, uh, because like I said, the the community is is awesome. It's a really active group of guys, and you know they're they're very very helpful. So any questions are answered usually pretty quickly. When do you think we could expect to see the Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps? I would I would expect um, early next year. All right. Uh, as something that users are going to be able to play around with, you know, uh, other than that, they'll, if they keep an eye on the code repositories or maybe a command line program, they may be able to play with, uh, in the meantime. All right, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. It's been, uh, it's been great. Thanks for having me. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Later. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.